sometimes think I spend more time here than in Australia, but it's not true, really. Um, <clears throat> so what I want to do to, today is uh, talk to you about how we're using data site metadata to augment our existing discovery system. And I feel a little embarrassed talking after uh, Vishwas because that was a really amazing talk about um, a whole range of fantastic things. This is a little bit more mundane. Um, it's going to seem, to me at least, not quite as exciting, but hopefully still of interest to you. So first, a very small bit, um, even though I apparently spend all my life in Europe, perhaps some of you have not yet heard me talk about the Australian National Data Service. Uh, we are an initiative, unsurprisingly, of the Australian government. Uh, we got two tranches of funding, um, one from a thing that was focused on collaborative research infrastructure and then uh, a second tranche from a thing that was called super science. I'm not entirely sure why, because it's not particularly super and it's not just science, but anyway. Uh, we're a collaboration between Monash University, the university that I work at, the Australian National University, and a federally funded R&D organisation called the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation. I can't think of a good equivalent in Europe. Uh, we're about 50 staff, and we have a couple of things that we say we're interested in. We're interested in more researchers reusing more data more often, so big focus on data reuse which came up already at the NordBib conference. And secondly, this idea of data as a first-class object resonating very nicely with the previous talk. So it's not just about publications. It's about data as being as important and in some cases more important than publications. More recently, we've started talking about what we're trying to do in ANS as enabling for transformations. So we're trying to achieve transformations from, and you, there's a subtle difference there, you'll see that that column is headed data, that column is headed structured collections, but essentially from things that are unmanaged to managed, so by unmanaged stuff that's in people's pockets, on USB drives, on hard drives, on their laptops, whatever, to structured collections of data that are now much better managed for the long term from data that is disconnected from the context in which it was created to data that is now deliberately connected into the context, much like those graphs that we saw in the previous talk. So making connections between the data and the publication and the research project and the researcher and the institution and the instrument and the services. So building this rich mesh of connections. From data that is largely invisible because it's in someone's pocket, to data that is now much more findable. And lastly, you remember on the previous slide I said we're all about data reuse, from data that is single use to data that is now much more reusable. And so those build up, if you like. You need to get it managed, then you need to get it connected. Once it's connected, it's much more findable. Once you've found it, then you can reuse it. And so our ultimate goal is so that Australian researchers can work better with data. But of course, we're not just about Australian researchers, we're making our data available to the whole world. As part of this, we're building this thing that we call the Australian Research Data Commons. So the, the metaphor is like a, a common area that people can come to, which brings together the data and the descriptions and the relationships between and the infrastructure that lets people add things to the commons. And the reason I'm telling you this is that what I want to focus on for the rest of my talk is what we call the window into the commons. So the window into the commons is our discovery system. And when we were trying to build our discovery environment for this Australian Research Data Commons, we had some deliberate things in mind. The first was we were not trying to replace discipline-specific discovery environments. If you're a marine researcher and you want just marine data, there are places that you can go to for that. And you probably know about those already because you work in that space. So we weren't trying to replace those, we were trying to complement them. So our goal was discovery across disciplines 
or discovery of data by people who are not within that discipline. The second thing that we are trying to do in our discovery system is we didn't want to say to people, you have to come to us to find data. So we deliberately went for a model where we go to where the users are. That is, we make our, our data descriptions discoverable through the information environments that people use, which primarily at the moment means making sure that people can find our stuff in Google and being in Yahoo and DuckDuckGo and whatever else is the cool kids are using. So we make the data easily accessible for people who then don't have to change their information seeking behavior. The third thing we're trying to do was provide context around the data. So it's not just the data, as I've said already, it's the data that's linked to the publications, that's linked to the institutions, to the researchers, to the research projects. And we did that for two reasons. One was to provide more context to help with discovery. And what I mean by that is, maybe you met someone at a conference, maybe you saw a tweet. I'll talk a little bit about Twitter at the end if I have time. Um, so you can remember someone's name, or you can remember the research project, but that's all you can remember. We're trying to make it easy for you to find that person or that project, and then from there, follow the links to the organization they work for, the projects they're working on, the data they've produced. But that context is also useful for assessing whether you care or not. So once you've found some data, you need some way of assessing its value and making links to funding bodies or to institutions is a way of helping you say, well, yeah, that was funded by the National Institute of Health, it's probably good, or that's associated with that research group over there, I don't want anything to do with it. So the context is helpful there. I said we don't replace discipline portals, we link to them, and we're trying to build, as I say, this window into the AIDC. So, what this looks like is this. So this is the production version of Research Data Australia. We have 40,000 odd collections, 5,000 odd parties. So a party is a person, sorry, control plus, wrong operating system. Um, a party is a person or an organization. We have a number of services associated with data and we have about 27,000 research projects. And so you can put in a search here, I'll show this in a little while, and um, it will search the underlying database and all of those things, those 40,000 collections, 27,000 activities, there's a web page for all of those that's being indexed by web search engines. So, so much for the context. Let me now talk about where the data site metadata comes in. One of the things that we decided to do fairly early on in our development of our discovery service was to not just support the, I'm looking for this query, but to support serendipity, to make it easy for people to find things that they hadn't deliberately searched for. And I think in the back of our heads when we were doing this, we were thinking of something a little bit like um, the Amazon system. You know, people who searched for this also searched for that. We didn't decide to build it like that as it turns out, but that was the kind of idea. So the, the essential idea is we provide suggested links and we start small and we gradually add functionality. So the first stage was what you might think of as internal suggestions. So if I go here and I say, oh, I don't know, I'm an Australian, let me search for kangaroos. Kind of contractually required to do this when I'm overseas. Um, okay, so here's a survey of kangaroos from the air. So I click on that and you'll see down the bottom of the page, it said, ah, here's some suggested links. So in addition to the search that I've done, it's saying, well, here are another 892 data collections with matching subjects. 
So if I want more stuff on kangaroos, because you know you can't get too many kangaroos, I can click on that and in the fullness of time, you can see this is a live demo. Um, in the fullness of time, no, it is actually doing something. Uh, that will go off and pull in, that was not what I wanted. It is still running. It's still running, but it's gone invisible. That's going to make life interesting. Um, okay, we'll see if it comes back. So that's, that was stage one. <laughs> yeah, excellent. This is, of course, exactly what you want for a demo. We'll just stop the script. Okay, so here we are, the first block of suggested links for this particular um, query. So these are other things that have got kangaroo stuff in them. So stage one was that. Stage two, as Jan said, we were involved early on in data sites. So we thought, well, now that there's a data site search API, what can we do with it? And so what I wanted to show you this morning is uh, not yet in production, uh, but will be in production by the end of this month, I think. And what we're doing is we're using the title of the record that someone is looking at as a search probe against the data site metadata. So rather than just doing suggested links inside our own collections, we're broadening that out. We search in real time. We start for the best possible match. We reduce the match percentage if we don't get any results. So we start off by looking for all the words in the title. If that doesn't work, we will look for most of the words in the title. If that doesn't work, we look for some of the words in the title. And we preferentially rank data set results ahead of the other resource types that the data site metadata displays. So what this looks like, living dangerously now, not only am I doing a demo with a browser that's been shown to be problematic, I'm now doing this on alpha co code, running in the cloud, kind of ratcheting up the degree of difficulty here. It's, it's like walking on a tight rope, tight rope with my blindfold on. So if I search for kangaroo, actually no, kangaroo is a bad example for this one. There's probably not going to be a lot of good matches in data site. Let me look for marine sediment, where I know that this is going to work better. So again, I do a search. Yeah, helpfully they're reminding me it's a demonstration environment. Um, I get the same kind of results. So let's say I'm interested in sedimentation stress in this particular kind of coral on the Great Barrier Reef. It's Australia, I'm allowed to click on this one. Okay, and what I get again is suggested links. Now you see, it started off by providing the internal records and then in real time painted in external websites, 2144 collections. In fact, if I do a Refresh, you probably see that a little bit better. So internal records, external website. So that's a search in real time against the data site metadata. We haven't pulled the metadata for data site across. We're using the API to query in real time, pull stuff back. So I can do exactly the same thing as I did before. I'll probably get the same script error, but you know, let's Let's give it a go. Okay, so now I have, I'm pulling back the data site metadata using the search API. Let's say I'm interested in this. I hadn't actually thought about the interacting effects of CO2 partial pressure, but having read it, how could I not click on it? And so I click on it and it tells me, well, here is the description, here's a citation, it's a collection. As I said, we preference collections up. And I can now look at the data site metadata. So I bounce off to the data site service. More interestingly though, I can say, well, I actually don't want to see the data site metadata. I've looked at enough metadata already. I want to go to, well, no, 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 I don't mean it like that. I mean, everybody loves metadata, right? <laughs> but I've now read enough of the metadata to decide that I want to go off and look at the record. I'm not anti-metadata, please do not. Whoever's tweeting, do not tweet Andrew said, <laughs> I'll never be allowed back into the country. Um, so I can just click directly and go bypass the data site and go straight to the original source. Okay, I can relax now because the demo worked. So that's stage two. 
Stage three, we're still thinking. So we're, we're building this out in stages. So what other things could we mine for those additional suggested links? Uh, we have some ideas. The National Library of Australia is one possible target. They have a very comprehensive system called Trove, uh, which we could search against. Uh, there's a thing called the Australian Spatial Data Directory. There's the Atlas of Living Australia, which is associated with GBIF. In fact, GBIF stole the director of the Atlas of Living Australia to run GBIF, but I'm not bitter. We've got over it. Uh, and because we don't want everything to just be Australian, we're in conversations with Dunce in the Netherlands about using um, Narcis, uh, which is a research portal that the Dutch have as a possible target. And I'm sure there are other ideas will come along with as well. In terms of data site, we have a number of possible enhancements that we're now looking at. Um, one would be we're simply taking the data site search ranking using the search API. We might want to think about tweaking that at the data site end to highlight the things we care about. We're in discussion with the data site developers. It would be nice if you could do this sort of see also, this suggested links thing at the search level, because at the moment, if I do a search, and scroll up and close that. I only get to see those suggested links when I go into the record. It would be nice if I could see suggested links for the entire set of records rather than have to look at each one. Um, it'd be nice if you could use the path that the user followed to get to the page they're on, to get to our page they're on, to re-rank terms in the search query. In other words, to say, oh, OK, they followed this sequence of things to get here. Let's use that to tweak the results of the search. And at the moment, we're just using title. Title is actually a relatively poor thing to search by. It'd be nice if we could use our subject text against the data site subject text to give you much richer results. But that's going to push the search algorithm a little bit harder. We've got some other ideas. It'd be nice if you could say, I'm looking for things with a similar spatial coverage or things with a similar temporal coverage or both. Uh, it'd be nice if you could mine information about um, the co-authors. So here's some other stuff written by these people. So again, it's this kind of Amazon richness that I was talking about before. Things that share keywords, lots of ways that we could improve the, the um, uh, the, the ways in which we help people stumble across serendipitous stuff that they would have otherwise missed. There are some issues for the future. Uh, conversation that I have not, not yet had with Jan is, does he care that if we click on, someone clicks on view resolve record, they bypass data site altogether and they just jump directly to the underlying thing? Hopefully not, but we haven't had that conversation. Okay. You can tweet that he shook his head and said he didn't care. Um, how's this going to scale? This is obviously, as soon as you start doing federated search, those of you that have been in this game for a while, as soon as you start doing federated search, how's it going to scale to lots of see also services? So if you imagine in this example that as well as 2,144 collections from data site, we have another 10,000 from Narcissus and another 3,000 from somewhere and so on and so on and so on. How's that going to work? And you, what you may not have noticed was that, in fact, you can use the web page as soon as the page loads. You don't have to wait for those things to paint in. But you could imagine someone sitting there twiddling their thumbs waiting for the, you know, the, the sixth of six of these to, to fill in. And that's not a good user experience. Uh, and how's the UI going to work? I mean, you can, again, if I flick back, you can see that that's, that's fine with one external collection. It's going to be OK with 10, not really going to work with 20 or 30 or 100. So uh, we're still thinking through those, how that's actually going to work in practice. Um, and then, of course, there's the what you might think of as the who cares question. So we worry about all of these issues. Does the actual user care? Is it going to be enough to simply say to the user, here are some suggested links, and we're going to blur them all together? You know. You, the user, probably don't care whether this comes from data site or from ANS internal or from Narcissus or from the Atlas of Living Australia. You just need to know, here's some other stuff you might be interested in. I suspect that's where we'll end up going, but I don't know. Um, slides are there. 
uh, information about me in the middle and links to the demos that I was using. Now, I have to say to you, ans.org.au is the website for all of us. It links to the production environment that I did the first searches on. Researchdata.ans.org.au is the pre-release beta thing. I can't guarantee that it'll always be up because we're fiddling with it. But it's the one that lets you play with the, uh, the C also, so I figured I should show it to you. And, you know, none of you are Australians, so you won't be telling my developers that I've done this. I can probably get away with it. Okay. Uh, now, before I finish, I should just say how delight to all of you who are out there who are tweeting. It's a delight seeing you all tweeting this particular session, and it's been really, really helpful for me to be able to just retweet somebody else who said something better than me. So let me encourage you to keep doing it. Thank you. <laughs>